Roto Rob here with former NBA champion and three time NCAA champion point guard Henry Bibby, who also had a very successful coaching career. The Franklin, North Carolina native will be inducted into that state's Sports Hall of Fame in April. Welcome, Henry, and thanks for taking the time to talk with us today. Thanks, Rob. Thanks for having me on. Oh, my pleasure. Firstly, obviously, we want to congratulate you on, on this induction into the North Carolina Sports Hall of Fame. Can you tell me what you were doing when you heard the news and how, did, how you reacted? Well, you know, I've, I've been kind of waiting for this for a long time and kind of wondering why why I haven't been inducted and also my brothers haven't been inducted. We've, uh, we've come a long ways uh, from the time that we grew up you know, on the farm in North Carolina and uh, to today. So, I, you know, I was really happy with it. I knew some friends of mine were promoting it uh, through emails and letters that they sent to the committee. And um, I was, uh, I was, I was pretty shocked to get the phone call from um, Bobby Guthrie, uh, in, in who's in charge of the North Carolina Hall of Fame, and and I was, you know, really, I was happy, very, very happy. You know, it's, um, to, it, to be a part of that. It's funny you should mention that that you sort of were waiting for that because I remember you playing in the late seventies with the Sixers towards the end of your NBA career. But when I looked you up, you know, like further into your career, I had no idea that you know you had such a decorated college career and were so involved in coaching over the years and i thought to myself wow how is this guy not already in there as well i i, I that surprised me um well yeah it, it surprised me too robin the thing about it is that you know i came from a very very small town of maybe 1200 people in my in my town we had two stoplights in the town and and um I had 19 kids in my graduation class. I had 56 kids in my high school. And, um, you know, I, I never thought about going out west to go to school. And uh, young black kids weren't going to the predominantly white schools in, in the country. Uh, and um, and I, I got an opportunity to do that. It was, it was incredible to make the adjustments from where I had, had uh, been living my whole life to move into California and just having a whole new world presented in front of me and being able to adapt to that. Uh, there were so many people that affected my life from that time to now. It's incredible the the paths of people that I've come across and the people that, that were influential uh, to me get to today to being in the hall of fame. So it's, there's so much credit I ha I need to give other people who stood by me and directed with directed me and had patience with me in the way of, of being here today. You know, one thing I'm really curious about from your perspective is you've had so many segments of your career. You had a college star, then you were an NBA champion, then you were a successful coach in both college and professional and in so many different leagues. Which period in your mind do you think of all of this cemented your legacy and earned this honor? You know, I, you know, Rob, you could go back, like you've seen, there are so many stages. I think my mom and dad uh, set the stage of, of what I am today and where I, I uh, went to, basically. Uh, you know, a solid background of parents, uh, hardworking people, uh, people of the earth, salt, salt people of the earth, farmers. Uh, grew up day to day knowing that you had to work, that nothing was given to you. I think that was the first stage of my life that I didn't even realize I had um, until maybe, you know, a year, a couple of three years ago, where you realize how important these people are. You, you might not, they might not get the, the uh, glamour or get in the newspaper like some of the other people, but. You know, my mom and dad were the instrumental people in, in making what it was, what, what I am today, and giving them credit to be in the, in, in the Hall of Fame because of them. Then the opportunity to go on to UCLA, which is another stage of my, my life. Um, you know, Coach Wooden, uh, you know, Jay Carty, who recruited me, uh, Gary Cunningham, who became a friend of mine, who was the AD and the coach at UCLA. And, 
since Sam Gilbert, he was a big alumni of the school. So that was a whole uh, level and different stage for me going as well. Then the NBA, going to the NBA and going to the right team in the NBA, mm-hmm. which, which built my built and helped my career. You know, where the hell was going to be next? If I hadn't gone to the next, I probably wouldn't have played in the NBA for the time that I did. Um, if I hadn't gone to UCLA, you know, those things wouldn't have happened. So, so there were so many stages in my life, and and going on to the NBA, then going on into coaching the minor league, uh, and, and playing the minor leagues, and, and going on and, and and coaching. I found out that you know, coaching was my probably my most satisfaction of being in professional sports and and in, in sports my whole life. Now, um, you last coached, as far as I can tell, for a Mexican professional team in 2020. Is that correct? Uh, yes. Yes. Have you uh, are you officially retired, or are you, or what, what what are you doing with yourself these days? Well, I'm still coaching. I'm going back uh, in a couple of weeks to coach back then there again. They, they have a professional basketball league there. And, oh, sorry. You know, uh, where it, it's it's kind of like what my book said. I wrote a book, The Addiction That Drove Me, and it's an addiction that I have. You know, I'm a junkie to basketball. I love basketball. It's in my blood. Uh, it's tough to get out. I still watch it. I still have relationships with coaches. And I love being a part of it. I've been, you know, the last week and a half, I've been putting things together uh, to, to help myself become a better coach when I go to Mexico again. Okay. So it's really interesting. Yeah, I, I'm not given anything up yet. I feel good about, you know, what I'm trying to do. Okay, that's awesome. And, of course, you come from such a major sports family, which you alluded to before. I mean, your brother Jim was an all-star pitcher in the majors. And, of course, your son Mike was a massive college star and then made the NBA all-rookie team in uh, first team in 1999 to kick off a 14-year career, like very uh, extensive career. How competitive were you and Jim growing up? You know, we weren't competitive. We were all in different sports, and, you know, he was like five years older than than I was, so I kind of missed that competitiveness. Mm -hmm. Um, You know, with me going in high school, he was basically out of high school. Right. Uh, With me getting in college, he had gone to to Vietnam uh, to to be be in the service. So um, we we weren't really competitive at all in, in what we were doing. It was just different sports we were involved in, and we just love the sports we were in. Well, obviously, a, a very gifted family in terms of sports. Um, and tell me what it was like to have your son follow your footsteps into college and ultimately pro basketball. I, you know, it was. I, you know, I didn't know he was that good. I knew he was. He was. He was a good player in high school, but he he wasn't playing against the top competition as some of the um, the other top players in the country and. You know, I coached them. I coached them during the uh, uh, when they had these uh, these AAU teams that were traveling. I coached his team, and he was pretty good at that time against some of the better players from Los Angeles. But I remember I was talking to um, I think Eric Musselman, who's now at the uh, University of Arkansas, and he was he was in the in the NBA at the time. And I called him up, and I said. And he had called me up and was talking to me about my son, asked him about, about my son. I said, well, is he that good? He said, yes, he's that good. He said, he should go first and second in the draft. I said, my kid? He said, yes, your kid will go first and second. <laughs> it was really interesting to know, to find out how good he was through other people. That is interesting, yeah. Let's, uh, let's go back to your days as a player. Can you give our listeners a scouting report of yourself as a player? <laughs> well, you know, I I, I I'm a very you know, cerebral player. Um, I I, um, I you know I I I've, I've fit into what the team needed. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, my first year in New York, I I didn't play a lot, but I was known as an instant offense. I would come in, I would pick up the pace, pick up the tempo, you know, and. and, and and to try to change the game around that way. And I usually came in when we were when we were down, when we were behind. So I would come in and give us that instant offense and what we needed to do, which was totally different than what I did in college. Because in college, I was kind of the quarterback of the team one year, and 
then they need to know more about a shooting guard. So uh, my roles, I've adapted my my career and my plan uh, attitude to what the team needed. So, uh, you know, after, and after I left uh, New York, I went to, to the Jazz with the Sophie Mary, and I became kind of a facilitator again. I was more of a quarterback, you know, get the ball and the pistol at the right time and, and know what we were doing. Mm-hmm. And uh, then I was traded to Philadelphia, and I became an insurgent <clears throat> point guard. Um, and I, I just ran the team and did. So my, my whole role was adapting to what the team needed. Right. And I think that any good player, any player who wants to stay in the league, you know, has to do that. I had some people to tell me, hey, uh, why don't you shoot more? Well, that's not what they needed me to do. Right. Of so, course. And I had to learn what kept me in the NBA, and that kept me in the NBA uh, being that, that role player, that quarterback when I played for Philadelphia to, to start and, and to play a ton of minutes and get the ball to the right people and make some open shots and be an assist man. So, you know, my my, my whole career has been adapting to situations. Now, thinking back to those days uh, when you were playing the NBA in the 70s, what's the biggest difference in today's NBA compared to the game back then? Well, you know, it's, it, to me it's more of a, a showcase now. It's more entertainment. Uh, you know, it's more more dunks. The guys are more athletic all around. Uh, during my time, we were more, you know, uh, uh, a, um, a execution type of player, playing teams and execution league. Um, uh, you know, we ran plays. Mm-hmm. You know, you didn't have guys doing all the dunking that you see now. Guys are much more athletic now. They, they, they do more things than we did. I think we, we executed better. Um, you know, they lift weights, you know, year round and year out. They lift weights before the game. We never lifted weights, so. It was a totally different game that we played, but it was a physical game. It was a little slower game than it is uh, today. Today is, you know, up and down the floor. Uh, you know, all threes are being shot. We didn't have many people see three. Well, uh, look at the. Yeah, I was, go ahead. No, sorry. I was just going to say. I guess one of the big differences is, well, as you as you uh, just established, it was more of a team game. It was like executing plays. Uh, it wasn't, you know, one-on-one isolation basketball where we put the ball in the guy's hand and, you know, 10 seconds tick off the clock, that kind of thing. Uh, it was probably more similar to the pure college game, which is changing as well, but uh, the, what college basketball was like was more of a team sport. Yeah, it's, it, you know, the game has changed, and now every time down the floor it's a pick and roll. That's all you see is a pick and roll, it's a lob, or... Like you say, it's a guy playing one-on-one basketball. That's mm-hmm. that's what it is. Uh, it's more like an all-star game. Every game is more like an all-star game. Where years ago, it it was a little different strategy. Now, you know which is better of the two. Who knows? I mean, it's it's, it's you know you adapt to the times. Times change from the time that I played, and it's good. It's changed for the better of basketball, and, and um, I'm happy to see that. You know, it's the way it is. I don't judge the way it is now. It's uh, you know, it's, it's probably less coaching on the floor and more coaching off the floor uh, to get these guys to do what you want them to do now. Years ago, you did what your coach wanted you to do. Right. And now they kind of just, you know, they, they get paid a lot of money. They they uh, they run the teams basically more so than the coach yeah. or management. It seems intuitively that um, players, there's a lot, like the star players are very well-rounded now. I mean, triple-doubles are just right, left, and center now. and I, Almost everyone uh, flirts with a triple-double, like the stars, almost on a gamely basis, game-by-game basis. Well, you know, years ago you had, they didn't keep all the records, but, you know, there were still guys that had, um, you know, things like that, but it, it wasn't as glorifying as it, or glorified as it is now. You know, Pete Maravich had the same thing. I they just think keep track of that. Pete, you know, would have had, uh, you know, he would have made as many three-pointers as Steph Curry. I mean, he could shoot that well. Um, uh, you know, he could he could have as many assists as as, as uh, LeBron James would have. I mean, mm-hmm. you know, these, there's a guy, but, but nothing was kept and glorified like it is today. Everything is glorified now. Uh, we weren't on TV as much, so you didn't see it. Mm-hmm. So now you have, you know, you have basically uh, 
three games going on every night on TV. I mean, you can get uh, the ESPN package and never miss a basketball game. So, mm-hmm. you know, it's, it's just more exposure now, and, and, and all those things are important. I remember we had a kid we drafted. We traded for um, Tayshawn Prince. Tayshawn Prince was mm-hmm. in Detroit. Played on the, the great team in Detroit and, and was a great, great player for them. And we trade. I remember we had a conversation in our office before we picked them up, and uh, they had gone to analyticals. And you know, analyticals, you know, not anything that us old coaches believed in. We could we could look and see mm-hmm. how guys played and where they shot the ball well from and what they did. But now it's analytical. That you shoot the ball from this area, and that's where you that's where you go and shoot. So we. We went and traded for Larry uh, Tayshawn Prince because he shot the ball like 70% from the right side of the floor in the corner. So <laughs> opposed to the other side where he shot like 30%. So we needed a player in that corner because we had a player that would get to the lane and be able to kick it to a certain area. So the game has changed to be like that and more analytical than it's ever been. Yeah, absolutely. And another big change, of course, over the last, say, 20, 25 years is the advent of fantasy sports. Do you, um, uh, I'm sure you're familiar, like, that it's become a multi-billion dollar industry. Do you, do you play fantasy sports at all, Henry? I do not. I don't even know what it is. Oh, yeah. Um, yeah. I'm sure you know, like, uh, the the the, uh, the armchair quarterbacks, the draft teams. Uh, that's what my yeah, site's about. I, I, it. It. I, I know people that do it, but I've never done it myself. That does not interest me. Fair enough. Uh, that, that, yeah, it's not an entertainment for me. And but I do, um, I do want to ask you one thing though. Let's say you were a general manager of a of a fantasy team, and you had the top pick in a keeper league today. You had the number one pick. This guy, you, you know, build your team around. Who who would you take? Of the players now, yeah, this day and time. Uh, you know, <laughs> it depends on what position you're looking for. You know, where do you start building your team? You, you know, <sighs> Kevin Durant is really good. Um, you know, Steph Curry is great. Uh, Giannis from Milwaukee is super. Sorry, who was, uh, who was the last one you mentioned? Uh, uh, Giannis. Oh, Giannis. From, oh, um, he's the yeah, Greek freak. From oh, Milwaukee. Yeah, yeah, of the course. Greek freak. Uh, MB for Philadelphia. Uh, yeah, I mean, I, you, where, where do you want to start right. with your team? Um, um, you know, I, 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 I can't say. I, you know, all these guys are so valuable to what they do. Um, I, I think my top two would be Kevin Durant and uh, MB from Philadelphia. Well, that would be a hell of a front court. <laughs> yeah, yeah, right. <laughs> And how do you leave out Giannis and Steph Curry and LeBron James and Kyrie Irving and those people, you know? Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I might go with someone a little younger. Giannis, uh, Giannis is only uh, like 27. Uh, Durant's getting on in years, but um, uh, there's so many great young players in the game, too, now to, to look at. So, who knows? Yeah, they're, they're coming up. Yeah, it's, it's so many good players. So mm-hmm. many good players. When yeah. you uh, When you were growing up, who did you model your game after? I used to I used to like Sam Jones. Sam mm. Jones ended up coach, coaching me in in um, in New Orleans. Sam Jones was, you know, I used to watch the Celtics on TV on Sunday. Then I would go in my mom's room and take little paper balls and shoot shoot them in the head. And they were Sam Jones. I think Sam Jones was a guy that I that I loved. Another guy was Elgin Baylor. You know, these mm-hmm. guys are just they were super super at the time they played and. You don't really hear much about them now. I mean, it's, you know, we come and go. But uh, talking about two great players, and, and Sam n- never really got what he needed to get uh, because, you know, he played on a championship team with great players around him. Mm-hmm. But he was a glue player for sure. He was a glue player. It, Sam Jones and Elgin Baylor were my two people that I think that that if I could have been like, I, I would have loved to have been that way. What, uh, what do you consider the proudest accomplishment of your entire career? Uh, you know, you know, getting out of getting out of the South, getting out of North Carolina, mm-hmm. you know, getting out of the uh, the cotton fields, and and being able to make a life for myself. That was 
I'm proud to be able to do that. My mom and dad had third and fourth grade education, and they didn't go a long ways, and they wanted that for me. So I wanted to get out of there. I'm, I'm, I'm proud to be out of there and to be inducted back into the Hall of Fame. That you know, that's what North Carolina Hall of Fame. That's what makes it so important for me. Full it, circle. It it, yeah. yeah, it's just a full circle. I've gone from a kid with 1,900, 19 kids in his high school class, and. 1,200 people in my town to to be able to, you know, get on an airplane first time in his life flying to California and and um, and and going out there and, and making things happen for himself and come back again and be recognized as, you know, a Hall of Fame in North Carolina. It's just a, it's a great thing that has happened to me. I'm really proud to, to have been able to do that, uh, to get the education that I needed. Uh, that my parents sacrificed for me to get uh, to do these things. So I'm proud of myself for being able to stick with it. It wasn't easy. Uh, if I had to do it again, I probably wouldn't do it the same way, knowing what I know now. But, you know, it made me who, who I am today. Mm-hmm. Curious uh, where guiding the 2001 USC team to the Elite Eight ranks, because that was considered a huge surprise at the time, right? Well, and, and again, as you mentioned that, I'm, I'm one of the I'm the proudest that I was able to coach that team. You know, just last week I talked to two of the guys, uh, you know, on the team, and, and they, you know, it, it was always said how tough I was on them. And I apologized for being tough, and they said, please don't apologize because that made them who they are today. Mm-hmm. So, you know, that that's a proud moment when your your players can come back and say that to you. Uh, you thought you were tough on them. And at the time, I, I knew I was doing the right thing mm-hmm. for them. I knew that I was going, I was a father to them. And a lot of the parents didn't like me and said, well, we don't want you to be a father to them. But you have to show these people love. If you want people to perform for you, you have to show them love and you have to be sincere in your thinking. And I was very sincere in these guys being successful. One of the guys is a lawyer to this day, the guy that I talked to. Just a brilliant player, not talented, but just fit into what I wanted to do. He was like a little mini-me, uh, very cerebral, loved the game, and, and just was dedicated to the game. So that was another proud proud moment of myself and where, where I got to and being able to take you know 15 and 16 guys and blend them together, that's what's tough to do. And mm-hmm. I give so much credit to, you know, a Phil Jackson, uh, you know, a Red Arbach, uh, a Greg Popovich, who've done it over the years of being able to pull guys together and uh, show them what it takes to win, being able to work with them. That's what's important. Um, on the flip side, what would you say is the biggest disappointment of your career? Uh, the biggest disappointment... Uh, I, I was uh, I was um, getting interviewed for the Sacramento Kings job, mm-hmm. um, and um, uh, I had called in regards to get an interview, and 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 I got the interview. So I prepared for a whole week of of uh, getting paperwork together and, and telling them how I was going to put this team on paper and all that. And uh, Rajon Rondo, who's a, who my my uh, my son-in-law coached. Uh, was up there and and uh, I talked to him. He was he was supportive of me. I talked to Rudy Gay, who was up there, and mm-hmm. I was going to have Demarcus Cousins as well. So I was going to go in and get the interview for this this team. So I go to, go up there and I go the night before. I got all my information, and um, I'm going to interview with with Vladi Divas the next morning. So um, you know I get up there and and uh, you know I'm waiting. I put my clothes on. I go and have breakfast. And I come back. And I get a phone call uh, from the secretary telling me that uh, they've closed the interview and I'm not going to be interviewed. Hmm. And that that uh, Blotty was tired. He had found someone already. And um, I've never had anything hurt me so bad. That's the, the thing that hurt me the most ever in my whole career that, uh, that I'll live with forever. Yeah. Um. Let me ask you, uh, who's the best teammate you ever had when you were playing? By teammate, I don't mean the most talented player. I mean a team player who would go through a wall for that team, like that you knew had your back playing with. 
You know what I mean? Uh, yeah, I, I think it's Julius Irving. Mm. Julius and Irving and I became very, very good friends uh, during the time I was in Philadelphia. Our families were very close, and what a, what a dear friend this this guy has been, you know, on the court and off the court for me, and supportive of me more than probably anybody ever. Um, and, and just a, just a great guy to be around. I, another guy's been Bill Walton. Bill Walton has been a Henry Bibby fan forever. And he's always promoted me, always said good things about me. And I just, you know, I love the guy. And, and uh, you know, there's another guy, Andy Hill. Andy Hill is the first family that I lived with when I went to California. So uh, they were the first white family I, I've ever been involved with. And that he got me to change my whole thinking about people. Mm-hmm. So you don't judge people by their color. You judge people by how they are to you. And that family, Andy Hill brought me into his family, and his mother on, on her dying bed wanted to see me and wanted me to be there. You know, so I, th- those three people were impact people in my life. Mm-hmm. And it, probably on top of everything was Andy Hill and the family going and living with this white family, being from an all-black area in, in the South, living with this white family that that... You know, at night I, I wouldn't go out because where I was from. Right. But I, I got to learn that people are people, and 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 I saw color at the time, and I understand why people see color. But now I don't see color. You just got to learn who people are. I agree. You know, and, the, and and this person and his family just opened up their hearts to me, and I don't I don't see any color to this day at all. So, you know, people are people who are nice to me or nice to me not nice to me or not nice to me. So it, it it doesn't matter which way. But again, you got to give people a chance in life. And uh, these people gave me a chance. They put me on the right direction when I went to California. I didn't know anybody in California. Uh, and uh, saved my life, basically. Mm-hmm. Now, uh, same question, <clears throat> Henry, but um, this time I'm going to focus on players you coached. Best team player you ever coached guy that you just knew you could count on not necessarily the most talented but perhaps the hardest working the just the one that you knew whatever you asked him to do he'll do I, I tell you the, the team that went to the lead eight I you know I could pick out three or four guys uh, I had a kid like I was saying Brandon Granville the little point guard mm-hmm. uh, wasn't wasn't super talented um you know, he wasn't a Jason Williams that played for Duke at the time. Jason Williams was quick. He was athletic. He could do all this. Brandon Grabio was the coach on the floor. Right. He, he was the extension of me. And I've never had a player that has been that smart to know what we need to do on the floor. Mm. Um, I had a picture, just a frame of picture last week of Brandon and I together. Um uh, you know, we were talking, a great picture, and uh, he would tell me what we needed to do. And I loved it because I had programmed him into being who I was on the court. He knew everything that I knew. Did he so, uh, so, Did he go on and become a coach? No, he became a lawyer. He wasn't oh, oh that's the lawyer you were talking about. Yeah, no, it just sounded like he'd be a great future coach. You know, he, he could be a great anything he wanted to be, and that's why he, he went into law because, you know, his dad was in law, and he, he's a great lawyer. So, you know, the kid just knew he, he took us to the promised land, basically, because mm-hmm. of his knowledge and being able to to run a team, know what we needed to do. The, the team didn't need me because they had him. Right. And he was that, that cerebral player that control everybody else around him. Um, yeah, now, he was probably the greatest, the coach. Now let's talk about uh, the most talented player you ever played with. Now you mentioned Dr. J as the best teammate you ever had, but I can't imagine you had players that you played with that were more talented than him either. Or did you? You know, he, he was in a he was in a different world. A, a player that, um, you know, Pete Maravich was talented. Oh my gosh, he's so talented, it's unbelievable uh, in what he could do. Um, but he, he, you know, every night he could he could do just great things on the floor. A player who was great 
and didn't get his accolades because he played with us with George McGinnis. George McGinnis was one of the most talented people I've seen play basketball. Um, could do everything that he wanted to do. But George didn't, didn't dedicate himself to the game. Mm-hmm. He didn't love the game like Doc loved the game. Right. Doc loved the game. Doc loved to play the game. And he played it that way. George didn't play it that way, but George was just as talented as Dr. J. How about as a coach? Who's the most talented player you ever coached? Uh, the most talented, um, uh, you know, probably, um, you know, if you go to the NBA, the most talented probably Allen Iverson. Oh, well, yeah, he was pretty good. <laughs> yeah, he, he was talented. I, I've never seen a guy that size do what he did whenever he wanted to do it and, and talk trash to you about it. Um, he, he's probably the most talented guy I've, I've, I've coached. Um, yeah, that's a good one. Uh, yeah. Yeah, um, he, he's a good one. When you were a player, either in college or in the pros, who was the toughest opponent you ever faced? The guy was like, oh, i got to play against this guy again. I can't stand playing against this guy. He just he gets me every time. Do you have you know, a player like that? Yeah, uh, you know, Nate Archibald. Nate Archibald oh, yeah. from the Bronx in New York was unbelievable. He he played with a frown on his face every night, and he just hated you. And you know that he was going to get 29 points, he was going to get 10 assists, and he, would all, he was always coming at you. Really tough, tough to guard. He could go inside. He could go outside. He, he could do so many things out on the floor. Mm-hmm. And... And uh, the two guys in practice every day, Walt Frazier and Earl Monroe. You know, I played against those guys every day in practice. And, uh, you know, guys, you can't stop. It's it's unbelievable how good (laughs) they were and how methodical they were in playing. They weren't quick. They weren't fast. They weren't flashy. But they could do so many good things and just talent, just Mm -hmm. easy, slow talent. I've just seen so many good players. Um, um, you see uh, Norm Sloan, Norm Van Leer. Uh, you see Rick Barry. You play against those guys and, and how how great those guys are. Mm-hmm. You know, you play against you know Larry Burry. You play against guys like that that are just so good. John Havlicek, you know, JoJo White. You know, you couldn't – I had to guard JoJo White, and you couldn't stop him. You just couldn't stop him. Mm-hmm. You know, you couldn't stay in front of me so quick to get by you. There, there yeah. are just so many guys that are, you know, who 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 didn't get to do like the people are getting today because you don't have the exposure. We didn't have the TV rights as they have now. Well, I'm familiar with most of the names you've mentioned, but I did grow up in the '70s. And but I'm, what I'm curious about is uh, looking at today's game. Which point guard who's playing today reminds you most of yourself? Oh, I'm an old dinosaur guy. I, you know, <laughs> I don't know if there was any, any. Um, Is anyone you see you know, your game in at all? You know, not really, because you know the guards now do more than I did because the game has changed. Right. Um, you know, I, I was a, a point guard, a legitimate point guard, setting up the team and getting us in the offense. Uh, you know, I didn't do a lot of one-on-one and, and uh, isolations, which they do now. Um, so, you know, the game has changed. You don't see the the slow dinosaur guys like, like I was, so to speak, in, in setting up the team. Mm-hmm. Oh, we, didn't, we didn't run as much. We didn't fast break as much as they do now. Everything now is a fast break, push the ball and to the point guard, getting it up the floor, getting it to the basket. Years ago, you know, you get it out, you're under control, fast break, and you're into a place, setting it up, you know, where a dot could come off and get a shot. Right. You know, now... The point guard now gets it. He goes. He doesn't worry about, you know, if LeBron is in the corner, he's going one on one. Right. So it's the game has changed, uh, and I don't think there. Are, yeah, I, I I don't see too many. You don't like me anymore. I you know it's kind of like Dwight Howard. I, I don't think people know how good Dwight Howard was. You know, he was he was one of the best centers to come through the NBA. Um, and you, he can't. It's tough for him to play in this day and time because he's a dinosaur. They don't play that way anymore, and it's kind of the same way that that. Um, well, now you got guys like Nikola. 
Nikola Jokic, you know, he's a center who's, you know, getting yeah, a triple double know. every game, you know, and, and going yeah, out behind you know, the arc and shooting threes. It's a different game. Yeah, where, where, where was Shaq play? There's no place for Shaq to play. Yeah. As great as he was, yeah. he, if this is the, the kind of teams they're playing, Shaq couldn't play as the, good as he was. The traditional center has kind of gone the way of the dinosaur a little has bit. Gone, has gone away. You know, yeah. Elijah won. We're, we're, you know, as great as he was. You know, you don't have those guys anymore. All right, uh, just got one quick question, and if you wouldn't mind staying uh, on the phone after we uh, sign off. Sure. Uh-huh. But uh, uh-huh. I'm going to put you on the spot here, Henry, and ask you, who's going to win the NBA championship this season? <laughs> oh, uh, I, you know, uh, that's a tough one um, because teams are up and down. You know, I think the Suns are playing really well, playing mm-hmm. good basketball. They they, they had a taste of it last year in yeah. Austin. So mm-hmm. I think they have a good shot to get back there again, you know, if they stay healthy. Um, you know, I don't know how Milwaukee does it with just basically one guy and, and another guy, half of another guy. Uh, I don't know how they play so well together. Well, you know, I, <laughs> they've got Drew Holiday as well. They've got a big three there in Middleton, Giannis, and Drew Holiday, and with the good supporting yeah, they're staff. Not, they're not they're – not, top guys, so to speak. You know, they're not like the superstars. But you don't always need the superstars. No. You know, a la Lakers, you know, but again, yeah, I I, I I, see the Lakers moving up. I see they can get better. I haven't given up on the Lakers yet. I think they well, can surprise a lot of teams. It looks like both them and the Clippers will be in the playing tournament this year, so no yeah, guarantee. You know, but I, 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 I think once they, they figure it out, and it takes a while when you figure out things like that. I, yeah. That's why I give so much credit to a guy like Phil Jackson, a guy like Red Arback, mm-hmm. who uh, and, and and Greg Popovich, who put together you know three, two or three, three superstars together. Look at what Pat Riley did down in Miami with those three guys. So the the Lakers got a shot, but they got to figure out who's going to take a back seat. It has to be somebody to take a back seat. And Anthony Davis can't get hurt. And Westbrook has to be Westbrook again. If, if they're that, they're going to be really tough to knock off. Yeah. You know, uh, I'm coming on Memphis. I don't think they're going to win it all, but they have really come on. Uh, they have they, they have probably the top three-point guard in the league, mm-hmm. this guy. Yeah, what? around. Oh, yeah. yeah. He can play. Yeah. Anyhow, Henry, um, that was great. I, I appreciate your time so much. And once again, congratulations on your induction. Definitely well deserved. Definitely um, long deserved. So um, thank you, thank you for your time today. Rob, thanks for for having me on. Okay, have a good day. You too.